everybody, thanks for coming um, to the Voices of Progress panel discussion. Uh, we have an awesome group with us today. I'm going to kick things off and give a, a bit of an intro and then turn it over to some of the fantastic people from Audible that we have here. How many people are Audible listeners? Raise your hand. OK, quite a few. We have a few, a few folks that we have to indoctrinate. We'll get you there by the end of the, uh, end of the session. Um, so first of all, we'll introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Matt Quinn. I'm a VP of Software Development at Audible. I run our Amazon technology team, so all of the code and products and services that integrate with Amazon, including Alexa, Fire OS, and WhisperSync for Voice. I'm actually located up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We have a development office up there, and that's where the bulk of those teams are. So all, all of the Audible functionality, so listening to Audible on Alexa devices. Okay. Yep. Uh, Kushmi? Hey. Hello? Yeah, should be on. Uh, so hey, I'm Kushmi Dedia, and I'm a software engineer at Audible. I recently joined like 10 months back, and I'm loving it so far. And my current listen is behind her eyes. It's a psychological thriller, and I strongly recommend if you guys are into psychological thrillers. It's an amazing book. Okay. okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. Is this is this one better? Am I good? <laughs> Whew, my gosh, for you guys. Wow. Um, my name is Kat Lambricks. I am the head of Audible Studios. Um, so I oversee all of our production here in the U.S. Um, as well as Canada and a couple of our other international marketplaces. Um, I was joking with these guys that my current listen is Fifty Shades Darker. Um, it's not. We didn't produce it, so I'm not <laughs> listening to it. Um, I'm actually listening my way through the Harry Potter series for the second time. So I've just revealed the depth of my nerd to you guys. Please don't tell anybody. Can we cut this out of the, out of the video? We're good, right? Yeah. He's not paying attention. I think we're good. Hi, I'm Kath. Um, I've been at Audible for around four years now, and I've always been in the UX team, and I've been uh, one of the UX leads on Alexa for around three years. And I am currently listening to two books. One is Bad Blood, which is an incredible expose on a healthcare company. If you're interested in that, you should listen to it. And also Trevor Noah's Born a Crime. Hi, I'm Loud. I'm Jen Lee, I'm a software development manager up in Cambridge with Matt. On, I manage a piece of the Audible on Alexa team, specifically internationalization, modernization, and uh, Audible's presence in the Alexa companion app. Oh, and I'm listening to also like way more books than I can list, um, but Measure What Matters is a really interesting book right now that talks about OKRs and stuff like that. Okay, thanks. As I said, great, great group here across a lot of different functions at Audible, so definitely give you guys a chance at the end to ask questions of the, the group. Um, so I'm going to start off, um, and I mean, everything at Audible is a, is a story, um, the way that we think about our, our work and, and everything that we do. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about um, the way that audio has been delivered over time, and then we're going to go kind of really, really deep into the nitty gritty of, of audio itself, the different formats and different considerations that we have to take into account from a both technical perspective as well as a humanistic perspective in recording. Um, we're gonna move, move on from there into c customer experience um, and also spend a fair bit of time talking about Alexa itself. But first, if we go all the way back um, to the golden age of radio, you know, this was a time when voice was really all that people had and could deliver over uh, you know, an analog signal through radio waves and really created the, the first time where, uh, through technology, uh, people would sit and listen to audio shows and audio performances. In many ways, it's really interesting to think about radio because a lot of the things that we're, quote, innovating on today and performances that we're creating harken back to these days where you don't have a screen in front of you, and all you have is kind of the pure voice. Um, and also thinking about communal listening experiences and not you know, jamming headphones in your ears and being by yourself, but actually listening with a group and how can we create experiences that actually cater to, to that type of environment. So we start there and you know, we, we make this massive leap um, with Audible into the first MP3 player. So we talk about this a lot. 
And it's really interesting, something that I, I honestly did not know when I joined the company that Audible innovated. Um, one of our, our people principles, our corporate tenets, if you will, is imagine and invent before they ask. And th this really is where it all began. Uh, I talked about this um, on the main stage about an hour ago. Uh, Don Katz running around, uh, you know, jogging around the parks of Newark with a fanny pack filled with cassette tapes, thinking there's just got to be a better way than me carrying this fanny pack filled with cassette tapes. Started thinking deeply about what were, at the time, really new technologies. Uh, RAM memory, the internet was, was relatively new in terms of using it for delivering things to consumers. And he decided to start delivering content through the internet and, and to create a device that would allow us to, would, would allow our customers to take the listen with them. So they could take it in the car, they could take it running, really wherever they were. And at the time, we actually have in our office, or had at one point these kind of mock-ups or actual screenshots and drawings of uh, what the interface looked like. And it was, you know, you would download to this d directory on your computer and then you would plug the device in and you would copy the files over. It was a very, you know, complicated process. It actually took hours to get a book onto the device. But once you did, it was great. And it was the first step, right? And then from there, fast forward again, another, you know, a uh, couple decades to the present. And now we have this, this new medium uh, of voice assistance and delivering Audible through the Alexa family of devices as well as through smartphones, right? We kind of we skipped that step when we came to the Voice Summit. Um, for us and many other companies, that was, that was huge, right? It was effectively the, the, the Audible player, but in the hands of, of you know, almost every, uh, hu or many, many human beings, many millions of, tens of millions of human beings. And a, and a way for us to get that content into their hands. So there have been these kind of inflection points along the way. And each time we've had to really think about how that changes what Audible does, how we're going to take advantage of that new medium and new technology, how we're going to kind of leverage it to get um, our, our content, our, cult, our cultural, cultural content into the hands of our customers. And they each present in a different way. And they each have their own really unique challenges. So that's kind of the beginning of the, the story in terms of the, the voices of progress and making progress with voices over time. So now um, we're going to move in, into and talk about a little bit more about um, the, the nitty gritty kind of details of audio. We're going to go pretty deep here into some of the technology and actual you know, thinking about sound and how it's perceived by human beings. So I'm going to turn it over to Kushmi to talk about that. Thank you, Matt. Okay, uh, before I get started, can uh, any of you give me a few words to describe sound? Anyone in the audience panel? Okay, I heard vibration, sound waves, pitch, amazing. Sorry? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So now that we've heard so many words, and uh, so many jargons, I heard frequency, pitch. Let's see how this translates in the world of Audible and in audiobooks. So uh, when we get raw recordings from our publishers, from Audible Studios, we actually do some processing before our end users can use it. So one of the things that we have to do is the elimination of noise. Now, how do we know what is noise and what is not noise? So here that you, you see a picture, this is the range of audibility. The cloud that you see here is basically the range of audibility of human ears. What that means is that everything that is outside the range is either not audible by a human ear or it exceeds the threshold of pain of a human. There are two major factors that affect this. One is frequency, and the other one is intensity. Now, for frequency, um, we have a lot of frequencies. Anything that is below 20 hertz is the infrasonic region. And elephants, moles, blue whales have the capability of hearing in this infrasonic region. Whereas if you go beyond 20 kilohertz, you have bats, dolphins, cats, dogs, that can actually hear in those extremely high frequency. But for humans, 
we can only listen to frequencies between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. So everything that, is, that lies outside these frequencies is considered as noise for us, and we eliminate it from the actual audio that we get from the producers. The second factor that is, is intensity. Now intensity is nothing but the amount of energy or the power of sound that is there in one unit area. Um, this is usually calculated in decibels, and for intensity, a human ear can listen up to 140 decibels. Now, we can listen to uh, uh, listen beyond 140 decibels as well, but that is the threshold of pain. Anything beyond that is either uh, no, it's not very comfortable for us to listen. So we eliminate everything that is either beyond 140 decibels or which is not in the human uh, uh, audible frequency. Okay, another thing is sampling. Now, our initial uh, devices, like Matt mentioned, our uh, FM uh, radios and the rabbit ear TVs, they all used to carry analog signals. Now, um, carrying this analog signal was, uh, it was very difficult. Uh, there were a lot of disturbance. You re remember, we used to adjust the rabbit ear antenna to, you know, kind of correctly get the signal. Or if you want to copy a cassette from one, like from one cassette to the other, we usually used to lose a lot of information. And the quality kept on deteriorating over time. So what the, we had the new generation of digital audio. Now what digital audio is, it's basically trying to replicate this analog audio into digital samples. And what the digital samples is basically, it takes snapshots of the analog samples at a particular time. So more the number of samples you take, the more better quality audio you're going to get. But at the same time, you're, you need a lot of storage to store this audio. The second one is uh, bitrate. Bitrate is basically the amount of, uh, or the number of bits that you have to store a particular sample. Again, more the number of bits you have, the better you can store it. In, uh, in our Audible app, we actually have different ways wherein you can store like a 22, uh, 22, 32, or a 22, 64, or a 44, 128 bit audio. So we provide a lot of different uh, qualities. Now that we've seen that what do we do for processing this audio, let's see how this entire life cycle is. When we get our audio from our publishers and from Audible Studios, here is where the magic happens. So what happens here, when we get this audio, we basically, there are a lot of things that is provided to our end users. One of them is metadata. When I talk about metadata, it's basically the author, narrator, the description that you see on the page when you are viewing the catalog. We store that information. Then when we get the audio files, we actually convert it into, uh, we encode it, we decode it. We have to do some quality uh, analysis of that. And then we generate um, downloadable assets and stream streaming assets. What is downloadable assets? Downloadable is something that you download on your phone, whereas streaming is something that you would play on Alexa. And then that is how it is provided to our end user. So there's an entire pipeline that goes through and it is provided to our users. And now to Matt. Okay, thanks Kushmi. Sorry. Take that. Um, so fascinating, right? Like we, you know, we, we, we're talking about voice, we're at the Voice Summit. We're talking about voice assistance, but there's so much that goes on behind the scenes and things that you really need to kind of deeply think about when you start thinking about entering into this space. And something that you know Audible's been thinking about now for, for a couple decades. So just kind of scratching the surface. Now we're gonna kind of transition from the real technical kind of nitty gritty into the human element of what we do. And Kat is gonna talk about Audible Studios, which are right down the street. All right. Uh Thanks, Matt. One of the things that Matt actually talked about in his presentation, which I hope you guys got a chance to see, was the fact that 
We are here in Newark. Um, I've been with Audible 10 years. We've been here the whole time. I actually lived in Newark for about six years. So our commitment to this town is one of the things that frankly keeps me with Audible. Um, we just had the chance to build these amazing studios right down the block. Uh, most of us walked here, which was great. Um, we have 10 studios on site. Um, they were built by John Stork, who is the guy who designed Electric Ladyland. He does a lot of ecclesiastical conversions. Um, so he's been a great partner for us. Um, he's a good friend of our VP. Um, so this is one, this is our little podcast studio. Um, we keep it set up all the time because sometimes we'll have authors who drop by or we'll have an actor who brings a friend with them. Um, one of our authors who was reading his own book brought this woman who had made a film about him. And so we have these people on site and it's great and we get to meet them. But what we do is tell stories and we bring them out to the larger world. So what I love to do when we have people in is chuck them in that studio. Um, we let them hang out in the celebrity lounge while they're waiting. Um, but we, we chuck them in the studio and we say, like, why don't you guys just, just chat about something? Like, what's on your mind today? Let's pick up a theme from your book. Um, you know, let's talk about what was it like to, to go behind the scenes? Because we get to do it every day. I get to be in the studio with people. I, I know what the process is like. But our listeners who are so devoted and we're so grateful for them, they don't always get to do that. So we love to give them kind of a behind the scenes look. Um, this is one of our other spaces. This is our celebrity lounge. Jenny, we're going really fast. Should I talk faster? I feel like I shouldn't talk faster. Nobody's going to understand me. Uh, <laughs> this is part of our studio setup. When, you, when we first started, we had six kind of smallish studios. And, and as we've grown our catalog and our reputation in the industry, we've had the chance to grow our space. Um, so this is just, it's a great breakout space for us. Honestly, we are lacking a little bit of room at the office. Sorry, guys. Um, so when we have impromptu meetings, it's really nice to be able to kind of duck into one of these. Um, but we do bring folks out to Newark. Um, we bring people like Claire Danes out here and Zach Quinto, and it's nice for them to come in and see, hey, this is a really comfortable space, but at the same time, it's a really heavy duty working space, uh, which kind of leads to our next slide, um, which is how do we actually make an audiobook? What, what do we do in the studios? Um, we have a team of about six or seven producers. Uh, we get a book, we get to read it, which is amazing. Like, I can't believe somebody pays me to read all day. Like, I don't know, it's been 10 years and nobody's found out. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna write it. Um, <laughs> so we cast our book. Most of what we do is single voice stuff occasionally. Um, you'll see the picture, that was our, our first big multicast recording in our new studios. It was an adaptation of a William Gibson graphic novel called Archangel. Um, go out and pre-order it. Um, it, was, it was kind of one of my babies, but it was, it was a great project. Um, but you know, I'd say 95% of our stuff is single voice because we come from a tradition of storytelling around the campfire. So you want one person to be telling you a story. Uh, we record the book, we give it to our narrator, we have an engineer and a director who are in the studio with them. It takes about three days to record a book. Uh, once we're done recording, we send it out to an editor, it takes them about two weeks, they go through, they listen for pronunciations, consistency in character voices, just to make sure that everything is sounding really great. Uh, they send us back some corrections, every book has corrections, new actors are always like, oh my god, I have to come back, I screwed up, you guys are never going to hire me again. Literally everyone has corrections, so we bring them back in. Um, then the book is basically done. We do a little bit of music here and there. Our listeners tend to be agnostic about music. What they really want is the experience. But if it's something super special, um, or if we do you know, a book that's about music, it obviously makes sense to have it in there. Um, and then we hand it off to the audio processing team. Um, so that's kind of, it's the beauty of, of I think, being at Audible and working for a large-ish org, um, at least in my world. I don't know, maybe for you guys it's not big. Like, I come from the studio world where if you have five people, like, you're a big studio. Uh, but the beauty is that I can focus on performance and my actors and my books, and then I can just kind of hand it off to somebody else, so. Uh, what kind of stuff do we record? So this is the part where I get to brag about my team. Um, we do, you know, Matt talked about Mel Robbins a little bit earlier, um, which has been a really interesting project. Mel sat down with eight people who she went through a whole course of self-development with. He's probably already listened to Mel Robbins, so like he doesn't need to hear me talk about it. Um, we just did a project called The Radical King, um, which was kind of my other, other baby. Um, it's a collection of actors reading Dr. King's essays. And this was really uh, near and dear because it was the first time the King estate actually allowed actors to speak his words. Not even for Selma were they allowed to do that. So that was a great one. We recorded most of that here, which was super cool. 
Um, so that was kind of a cast of narrators, but they were all doing individual things. Um, we do do multicast stuff where everybody interacts and it's kind of uh, like, I hate saying old timey radio because even though it's the tradition we grow out of, it's something a little bit more modern than that, but that's where it comes from. Um, we do original productions that are written just for audio. A couple years ago, we did a project called The Dispatcher with John Scalzi, um, and that was written just for us, which was really cool. It was one of the first ones, and now we do lots and lots and lots of them. So we're getting to bring stories to life that otherwise wouldn't get told, which is a super cool opportunity. Um, and Matt had mentioned earlier we were doing a bunch of theater stuff, and I just had a really, really cool thing happen. Uh, I had a colleague from Brazil call me up, and she was like, hey, I just listened to Harry Clark, and it was it had a run uh, in Manhattan, and it was a Billy Crudup one-man show, and she was like, I never would have gotten to listen to this, except that you guys recorded it and put it out there. And uh, it was one of those moments where I was like, right, this is why I do what I do. Like, this is why I love my job so much. So the theater stuff has been really cool. It's been a great fit, and we have an awesome team. Uh, so we're, we're super excited about that stuff. This is kind of the breadth of, of what we get to do. Tell me more about the fun stuff. OK. I mean, twist my arm. Um, what else is super cool about my job? I get to work with authors all the time. Um, we had Robert Caro do an original project for us. He's always written in the third person, historically. Um, and he wrote in the first person and, and talked about his life for two hours. And we got to capture that on tape. And it's something much like StoryCorps that otherwise we wouldn't get to do. Uh, you're lurking behind me. Am I running out of time? You're good. <laughs> just checking. <laughs> you know just, I can talk about this for she'll like keep six talking. hours. Kat, I will. Cat has probably the best job at Audible. It's pretty cool. I mean. It's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. All right. Um, so we get to do lots See, and lots of fun you. original stuff. I'm going to keep talking real, real, just really fast. Keep um, going. The, no, the original stuff we get to do is really cool. The fact that we get to bring books to life is super cool. Um, and the fact that we get to hand it off to somebody else to take care of the tech is also really cool. So now I will <laughs> hand it off to someone else. Thank you, Kat. All right. So more about the fun stuff. Um, and again, you know, I just I, I love hanging out with Kat and hearing about all that she gets to meet all the celebrities. And you know, um, she she came up to Cambridge um, last year and talked to our teams there. And Kevin Hart had just come in to record, and she actually had all these outtakes that we played for the team. So we get access to you know little bits of, of content like that. I think some of them actually made it out there. There was one on our in our, our reel this morning. Uh, about memoir, he said. I learned how to say memoir this morning. He was saying memory. So, you know, really kind of, again, just human interactions that we're having with these folks and these actors that come to light in the stories that we're telling. So, next we're going to talk, um, Cav is going to talk about uh, Alexa and about, you know, I, at the beginning I kind of talked about these three huge leaps, right, and about uh, customer experience on voice assistance, Alexa specifically, some of the challenges and some of the things that we've learned in, in developing customer experiences on Alexa. Kev? Thank you, Matt. So you've heard a little bit about the history of Audible now and how we went from the MP3 experience to now uh, we have our smartphone experiences. Alexa, however, has been a total game changer for us and an interesting fit. And I'm going to discuss a little bit about the challenges and learnings that I've had while working on this. Um, so first, I'll talk about why Audible is super different from everything else you use on Alexa. Um, a lot of the things you do on Alexa are probably very short and transactional. You might ask for the time or the weather, or set an alarm. It's, it's quick. Audible, however, is super different. You're listening to a book. You're following a narrative. You're getting to know characters. Um, and even when you listen to music, you, don't, you aren't necessarily paying attention to a story. And with Audible, you are. So we are trying to figure out um, how, how do people listen to this more longer form content in a more social setting, not, not with headphones. And that's been one of the big challenges. Um, and then. On the flip side is why is Alexa challenging for Audible? As I just mentioned, um, it's you know it's it's a social device, and then and then where it's for the first time we're not designing for a screen. So as, this is our app, and let's say you want to listen to a book, you can um, select a book from your library, you can press the play button. You can choose some controls that are in front of you, set narration speed, maybe pick a different chapter. You know, the, the parameters are pretty limited. You can't really go outside the scope of what you see. 
However, with Alexa, we have to predict anything that you might ask for. You could say, read me a book, and we'd have to guess which book you're asking for. You can say, faster or slower. We wouldn't know which narration speed you'd want. You, so there's a lot of things that we just have to guess, and we have to think of all the questions that you will be asking us, and we also have to figure out what the right answers are for you. So that is the first challenge that we have been working on. Um, and then moving on. Um, so as Matt was talking about earlier, um, you know, there used to be the days of the radio where families used to sit together and listen to things together. And Alexa brings back an opportunity to do just that. Kids love Alexa. They love listening to stories on Alexa. So it's our job to create safe, interactive, and engaging experiences with kids' books. We are trying to change what family time means these days. Uh, family time could, be, could mean watching a TV show, but it could also mean listening to a book with your child, getting to know those characters, a slightly more productive, maybe more educational experience. So that's one of the other things that we've been working on. And then, um, and then, um, you know, I don't know if any of you are reading this, but I find it hard to even look at. Um, and we have the same challenge with voice, which is cognitive overload. You know, Alexa can tell you a lot of information, but even in my real life conversations, if someone is just telling me something for a long period of time in the same voice, I tend to zone out, and people zone out on Alexa. So it's our job to break information up in, in easy, understandable bits that are still engaging and exciting for the user, and that when they've, whatever they take away from it, they can remember. And that's super important, especially when it comes to, um, you know, giving, telling people about our membership, for instance, or if they've asked um, to tell them about a book. They need to understand what we are telling them, and it's very important. So these have just been a few of the challenges for us. And again, as a designer, I'm constantly trying to think of some of the challenges that you as users might face. Um, uh, if you guys own Alexa devices, you've probably experienced asking her something and getting a completely unrelated response. So as I mentioned, I have to predict all the things that you ask, and I also have to write answers for those things. But Jen here is going to go a little bit deeper into some of the technical difficulties and, and also why, you, why that happens. Thanks, Kev. I would love to go into all the details about speech recognition, natural language understanding, slots and tense, and how we're a first party skill that's fully integrated into the Amazon ecosystem. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. So if you're interested in any of those things and all the funny stories that go along with it, feel free to follow me into the hallway. I'll even bring my laptop. I can show you the pictures. <laughs> all right. Thank you, guys.